You are listening to the Maker's Church Podcast. For more information about our community, please visit makerschurch.org. If we've never met, my name's Derek, and I have the privilege of serving here at Maker's Church as the lead pastor. And it's so good to begin the Christmas season with you all. It's finally here. And if you were with us last week, we talked about how long it took to get here this year and how to survive the holiday hustle. And I hope that many of you naysayers about decorating uh, for Christmas before Thanksgiving have already begun. Uh, We've done it here. So um, I got a lot of text messages and and Instagram posts about people who were compelled to decorate before Thanksgiving this year. So thanks for listening. Um, Before we get into the sermon, I just want to take a moment to just celebrate all that God is doing through all of you. Um, If you were here for Thanksgiving, if you made a meal, dropped it off, or came and served at our Thanksgiving meal this week, would you just stand up? Just stand up. Don't be shy. Look around. This is an amazing, amazing response. Um, If you were out of town or traveling, you didn't have the chance to be here, it was just an incredible time um, of our our community rallying together to make a meal and share it with the community. And um, Patty's probably not, there's Patty right there. Patty, just stand up. You're going to hate this. But Patty has been literally in the kitchen for like a whole month, um, cooking for so many different events, including the one today. And Patty, you're such a gift to us. Thank you for your leadership and your commitment uh, to feeding us and so many other people. It's just so great. I mean, I I wasn't even able to be here. I was actually working on Thanksgiving. And it was just so, I was just so proud of you all as 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 a community responding and creating a meal like that. And then yesterday... We had a bunch of people show up, a bunch of volunteers to deck the halls and make it uh, Christmas in here, which was just so neat. And I just want to tell a quick story about Lisa, and Lisa's probably hiding. I tried to get her up here on stage. Um, I'm going to find you. You're in here. But Lisa is new to our church. Uh, She's been coming for about three months, and she literally found us because she was walking by. And she started coming to Maker's Church, and uh, word got out that she was an interior designer. And so we asked her, hey, would you help us with Christmas? Would you help us kind of put a package together and lead some people to do it? And out of the generosity of her spirit, sharing her talent and her time, so much of her time, uh, we were able to make the place look like Christmas. So I just want to thank Lisa and the team that came to help do that. It's, it's an absolute embodiment of, of a value that we have around here at Maker's Church. And the way we like to say it is generosity is our measure. Generosity is our measure. And together we're committed to sharing generously our time, our talent, and our treasure. And over the last few weeks, um, there's just been an absolute overwhelming response of people sharing their, their treasure, their time, and their talent. And the, specifically this morning, we're going to spend some time Talking about what it means to share our treasure. What, what, is it, what, what does it mean to share with our money, our finances? And that's never a fun conversation to lean into or talk about, um, especially in church because there's so much uh, baggage around it. But there's a, there's a saying that gets said a lot this time of year. Uh, it's better to give than to receive. And we hear it a lot around the Christmas season, and it's, it's kind of an, uh, a response to the frenzied buying that happens on Black Friday and Cyber Monday and all the other days in between. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm a sucker for a good deal. And so, you know, but, but there, there's something about this sentiment, this statement that kind of reorients us and draws us back to really the, the main reason for the season. We know the main season, reason for the season is Jesus. We just sung about it. But there, there's something about this idea that giving is better than receiving. We hear it all the time, but the question I want to ask this morning, is it true? Is, is that true? And I've been, I've been trying to share this with my kids and get my kids, you know, from the very beginning to understand that Christmas is, is way more than just presents and opening presents. And they get so excited about Christmas because they see the presents under the tree. And I've been trying, my wife and I have been trying so hard to get our kids to see that Christmas is so much better to give than it is to receive. And my, my kids are coming around to this idea, but they say it this way and they see it this way. It is better to give than receive, but receiving's pretty dang good. 
And, and my son, just the other day, as we were talking about this concept, I, I saw him doing math in his head, like registering in his head. Okay, it's better to give than receive. I'm with you, Dad. I believe you. But if it's better to give than receive, who's going to receive it all? And I'll just volunteer. Because if we're all going to give to someone, I'll just, we've got to have somebody to give to, and I'll just, I'll volunteer for that. And that's the brilliance of my eight-year-old's mind. And so he's coming around to this idea. Is it better to give than receive? And I think that, that, that sentiment and that, that question is being tested. It's being tested in all of our own lives, and it's being tested in, in the ecosystem of our society is it truly better to give than it is to receive? And these, this, this sentiment, this, this message actually comes from the scriptures. It comes from the, the words of a, a man named Paul who had a, a life-transforming experience with Jesus Christ. And when Jesus transformed his life, he gave his life to helping other people experience the same thing. And he traveled all around the Mediterranean starting churches. And it was in this endeavor that, that he, he says this in Acts 20, verse 35, he says, In everything I did, I showed you but that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So is it true? What I think is so interesting about the, the conversation around finances, especially in the church, is it makes us squirm in our seats, and it makes me squirm standing here. It, it's, a, it's an awkward conversation to have, but I wonder why, because Jesus surely wasn't afraid to talk about it. Jesus talked more about money than he did about heaven and hell combined. Jesus talked more about money than he did heaven and hell combined. And 11 out of the 39 parables are all about our finances. And a reason why I think the scriptures are so clear about money is because we desperately need wisdom when it comes to our personal finances. If we're not careful, money can become a modern day type of slavery. Money's power in our economy, but in the economy of God, it can render us powerless. And so what would the scriptures say? What would Jesus have to say about the way we should have a relationship with our finances? Money affects every piece of our life. It affects our stress, our marriages, our relationships, our circumstances. It's deeply embedded into the fabric of the way our economy works. But I wonder what God imagined for us in the way that we would relate to money. In Luke 16, verse 13, it says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And I, th I think what God wants us to know, what God needs us to see, and what we need to know is true, is that God doesn't need our money. God is the great provider. God can do anything with nothing. God doesn't need our money, but he does want our hearts. God doesn't need our money, but he wants our hearts. And what the scriptures say is that where our money is, there is also our heart. And so this conversation around generosity has everything to do with the way that God longs to rewire our relationship with our finances. Living a life of generosity has the power to change the way we relate to our money and to each other. I want to start with this passage from Malachi. Malachi is a, an interesting book in the scriptures. It's the last recorded book that has anything to do about God before Jesus enters the scene. And in the book of Malachi, there's, um, there's kind of a, a, some correcting happening. We'll call it that in the first couple chapters about the way that the people are relating to God. And it's an interesting time in the, in the life of the Israelites because they're, they're, in, the, they're in the promised land. The, the temple has been rebuilt. The walls have been rebuilt around the city. They're living in a time of prosperity. But something seems missing. 
They're living in a time of prosperity. They have everything they want and need, yet something still seems to be missing. You ever felt like that? Like there's got to be more than this. Like even if you, after you got that great deal on Good Friday or Black Friday, you, you, you saved hundreds of dollars and you're like, yes. And even before the package shows up, you can kill, still kind of feel like there's got to be more than this. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, God is correcting them, and essentially he's saying, you're not giving me your best, you're giving me your leftovers, and it's, it's, it's the very reason you feel like something is still missing. He says this, he says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how shall we return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offering. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields and will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be the delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. I love this passage. If you were here last week, it says that, that, the, that the fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe. That the... But I love what, what God is saying here. He's saying, test me in this. Test me in this. But we have to be careful with a passage like this. We have to be careful because a human heart can read this passage and automatically foresee a great return on our investment. And we can be compelled to give so that we can ensure that we get. We want those storerooms full. We want the harvest protected. We want to be called blessed. And if we allow our human hearts to filter the way the word of God comes into us, we can look at this with the wrong angle, with the wrong point of view. This is where the the prosperity gospel comes from. This idea that God wants everybody to be rich. I don't know about you, but many of us have been walking with God for a very long time. And many of us have yet to become rich. See, the problem is, is that we've had this picture painted through pop culture, through, through our society, through, through many different movements of the church. We've had this picture painted that God is like a divine stockbroker. That if you give your money to the church or some Christian organization, that God guarantees to return it 10 or even 100 fold. God wants you to be rich. God wants you to be rich. And, and it's a lie if you believe that God wants you to be rich with money. But it's absolutely true if you believe that God wants you to be rich in love, to be rich with friendships, to be rich in forgiveness, to be rich in the ability to love God with your whole heart, to be rich in ways that you can give your life away. God longs for us to be rich, but it's not necessarily his plan for all of us to be rich in our bank accounts. And the, the, the biggest lie has to do with the fact that we're not rich because we lack faith. The biggest lie is if we just had a little bit more faith, if we just believed a little bit more, if we just proclaimed it a little bit louder, that God would make us rich. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to stand up here and say that God doesn't want you to be rich. He might have that set out for you. That might be the purpose and plan God has for your life. He may have given you intelligence and the ability to make a great living to, 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 to make great money. And that, that might be the blessing and the calling that God has put on your life, but it is not promised to all of us. Amen. And when we, when we look at a passage like this, and we look at it with the lens of a great return on investment, it's the wrong motive. It's a greedy motive. 
It's not giving, it's buying. It's a temporary loan with a certain expectation that God will return it, plus interest. But see, the, the focus of our generosity is not and should not ever about what we get out of it. The focus of generosity is all about the way that it blesses others and most importantly about the way it changes us. When we live lives postured towards generosity, it changes the way we relate to others, the way we see others, and the way that we see God. It gives us a huge appreciation for the way that God has blessed us with what he's blessed us with. God does not, prosp- not, God does not promise us all prosperity, but he does invite every single one of us to live generously. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul speaks on this principle of generosity. In 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, he says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And so, right from the beginning of this passage, it's, it's simple math. If we live selfish, we'll stay selfish. If we live generous, our propensity to be generous will grow. In verse 7, he says, Each of you should give which you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I think one of the other things that has happened in the church and in many different contexts is we have tricked people into giving and we have made people feel obligated to giving. And when we give in that way, it actually doesn't even count. Because the scriptures say that we should give Give what we are in our hearts compelled to give. See, obligation is when you give because of what somebody else expects from you. But conviction is what you give when God compels you to give it. And we should never give out of obligation. In fact, find a way to hear from God. Find a way to be compelled by his spirit the way to listen and respond in obedience to what God is calling you to, it could be perhaps the most transformative choice of your life. In verse 8, it says, And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Did you see the return on investment here? Did did you see the way the math works here? It it doesn't say that if you give, then you will be given more. It says if you give, that you will abound in every good work. See, the more you give, the more God is able to use the vastness of what he's blessed you with. This is what we call at Maker Church, we call this generative. It's actually one of our core values. The more that you give, the more fruit can grow from you. It's a similar metaphor as being pruned. The more that you give, the more that you prune off, the the, the, the more fruit that can come from your life, the more innovation, the more creativity, the more trustworthiness that you have to be trusted in the small things, to be entrusted with the big things. The the more that you give, you will grow and abound in every good work. See, the return on investment is not more finances or more money. It says it's more righteousness. It says the righteousness endures forever. This is not self-righteousness. This is righteousness that can only come from being obedient to what God is calling us to. The more good we do, the more good we're able to do. It's, it's actually God math. It's, it's exponential. It isn't just simple addition or subtraction. And we say it like this all the time at Maker's Church. If you choose to give 10% of your income, in the same moment you're choosing to live on 90. And that very decision causes you to be generative. It causes you to be innovative and creative. How do I make ends meet on 90%? And the creativity and, and the trust and the faith and the, the obedience that grows out of that is exponential. 
than perhaps any other decision that you make in your life. Verse 10 says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge your harvest of your righteousness. See, do you see what we do here all the time? It's, if we read this and it's like, if I give, then I'm going to get. If I give, then I'm going to get. If I give, then I'm going to get. But it, you, what you're going to get out of it is righteousness. You will be enriched in every way. So that, everyone say that, so that you can be generous on every occasion. See, when you live a generous life and God blesses you with more, it's so that you can give more. So that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. See, the reality is, is that God wants to get his blessings to you so that he can move them through you. God wants to get In verse 13, because of the service by which we have proved, by which you have proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. Did, did you see what the scriptures say? That through our generosity, people who are disconnected from God will see him because of it. Let me, let me reread this. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God. Other people will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of God. Do you see what it says? Put your money where your mouth is. That your, that your obedience accompanies your confession of the gospel. That we don't just confess our faith in the gospel, but that we begin to live lives that's obedient to that. And living a life of generosity is certainly a part of that. For in your generosity and sharing with them, and with everyone else, that others will praise God. Perhaps the best testimony that we can live is to live differently in relationship to money. Perhaps the best example that we can lead as followers of Jesus Christ is to live differently in the way we relate to our finances. It is not normal. It is not practical. It's nonsensical to a person who is disconnected from God to live a life of generosity in the way that God calls us to. And so it points back to God when we can live this way. And I think we really need to stop for a moment and see that generosity has nothing to do with equal giving but everything to do with equal sacrifice. See, God didn't write it in the scriptures, all of us should give this dollar amount. It, it isn't about the dollar amount. It's about the sacrifice. What does it cost us? Generosity isn't about how much you give, but how much it costs us. It's, we can see this here in Luke 21. It says that as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty, and she put all she had to live on. And so we can see here in the scriptures that it's not all about position, but more about our disposition. It's not about where we've arrived in life or, or the fact that we've given more than others. And it's everything to do with the disposition, with the posture of our heart. It has everything to do with the reason as to why we're giving. Remember, God loves a cheerful giver that is responding to the way that God is prompting them, not in any way out of obligation. But then it kind of gets into some other passages that we're going to look at here that that I think are going to be really helpful for us as we practically begin to learn how to live this out. And I think many of you, you, you are well 
on your way. You've been generous with your life. You've responded in obedience. But others in the room have, have, have never taken that next step. And I think these, these words of wisdom can help shape the way that we might respond in this because this has everything to do with the posture of our heart, not with the actions or the transactions that we make by swiping a card or by giving in a, in a bucket. It has everything to do with the way our hearts are postured. In Matthew 6, verse 1, it says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Have you ever done something good and made sure that you were seen for doing it? I think about this every time I, I give a tip, like at the coffee shop or whatever. I'm like, I'm guilty, man. I like make sure they're looking when I put the tip in because I just want them to know, like, I see you, I love you, but really I want you to think I'm a generous person. So make sure you're watching. Yeah, we, we've done that. Now you do it like you'll flip the screen around a little bit and hit 10% or 20% before so they can see it. By the way, do you guys know if it, like, if once they flip the screen back around, do they know if you tipped them or not? Does anyone? They can't see it? All right, I'm done. I'm done tipping. No, I'm just kidding. But it says to be careful the way you practice your righteousness. But is this passage in contradict? Does Jesus contradict himself? Because in another passage in, in Matthew 5, 16, it says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So which one is true? To be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others or to let your light shine before men. And remember that the last passage we just read said that it's because of our obedience that matches our profession of the gospel that people will praise God. So should people see us when we do it or should they not see us when we do it? Let's take a closer look. These two verses are really talking about two different ideas and the difference is really important. We should do good things so that people will see them and give praise to God. See, if you're doing it to get praise for yourself, it's the wrong posture, it's the wrong motive. But if you can do it so that the praise goes to God, then do it loud. Be visible. Stand on the, go tell it on a mountain. We should do good things so that people will see them and give praise to God, but we should not do good things in order to show off ourselves to other people. It's really the question of motive. See, there's a difference in being noticed when you do good and doing good to be noticed. There's a difference in being noticed when you do good and being, doing good to be noticed. There's a vast difference. And we have to test ourselves in this. We have to check our hearts as we respond in generosity. Verse 2 says, So when, so when you give to the needy. These are the words of Jesus. And I love that he just expects it. He doesn't say like, if you choose to give to the needy or if you come around to this fact or to this. He just says, so when. I love that he just leads through his language. So when you give to the needy. Jesus assumes that his followers are going to be generous people. That this would be a characteristic of somebody who follows Jesus. So when you give to the needy, and we should, we should as a church give to the needy. We are faced with a world that has so many needs. More needs than we could even make sense of. From poverty to loneliness to health problems to everything in between. There are so many needs. And I think the church should be at the tip of the spear in responding to those needs. And you know what the cool thing is in the world in all of human history? The church has been and will continue to be at the tip of the spear in responding to all of those needs. That's what the church does. But I think if we stop for a moment and just look a little closer, it says when you give to the needy, 
There's only one institution on the planet that gives to the most needy. There's a lot of institutions that give to needs in this world. There's a lot of organizations that give to aid and, and, and all sorts of different needs in the world, but there's only one that responds to the biggest, greatest need in all of human history. And that's to souls who are disconnected from the love of Jesus. Only the church has been charged with that. Only the church has been charged with responding to the greatest need of the human heart. And I would, I would beg, borrow, and steal to stay a part of that mission. Because we can serve all of those other needs, but those are just band-aids. The real human need, the real depth of the need of a human being is to be connected to Jesus, to be, give, be forgiven of their sins, and to come fully alive in Jesus. That is what the church is committed to, before and among all of those other things. And so if you're here this morning and you're new to church, you're not quite sure what the church does or why, why would anyone give to an institution like the church? It's because that's what we're committed to to living out the great commandment and the great commission. No other organization is charged with that mission but us. And if you're here this morning and, and, and you're disconnected from God, you, you've never been in a relationship with him, we would love to help you with that. And there's connect cards in the chair backs and there's a chance that says, I want to know more about Jesus. And if you check that box and bring it to us after the gathering, we would love to enter into a relationship with you where we can help you discover what it means to follow Jesus with your life. We know that it will change you. So that when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. And so what he's saying here is giving for human applause isn't giving, it's buying. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. So if you give for human applause, you'll get it, and your reward has come. If you give for human applause, you'll get it, and your reward will be in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And so what Jesus is saying is, if you have a disposition, if you have an inkling towards having a need to be noticed, a need to bring praise to yourself, then a safeguard is to give in secret, to let your, not let your left hand know what your right hand is, is doing. And this is a confusing passage. Because is Jesus saying always give in secret? How can we be a light? How can others give praise to God because of our, our actions and our transactions matching our professions and our confessions of faith? I don't think that this means that all giving must remain confidential. The widow with two coins was noticed. She was seen and praised, used as, as an example. Jesus isn't laying down a rule here. He's not saying that only secret giving honors God. He's saying that if you're tempted to give for the wrong motives, if you might get tempted to give so that you look good in front of other people, then you can remove that temptation by not letting your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He's given us practical wisdom of how we can still be obedient in the midst of our own sinfulness. He's equipping us and teaching us how we can go about still being obedient even in our own sinfulness. He's not saying you're wrong if someone finds out about your giving. If someone knows that, 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 that you gave or if someone saw you put something in or, or write a check or even if you share about the, what God has done in your life to move you to be become a person of generosity. There's so many stories in this room of people who have been moved towards lives of generosity, and those are testimonies worth telling. The reason it's, it's so important to guard your heart and test your motives is because the reason why you give will determine the effect it has on your life. It says, then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. What's the reward? What's the reward? Righteousness, but what, what does that mean? 
I, I don't know for you. But I know what God invites us to do is test him. He says, test me in this. Test me in this. What God longs for us to do is to liberate us from anything that might be keeping us captive. And if we look around the world today, look around our nation today, our finances have a grip on us. And God is longing to liberate us from this. Remember in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, he says, whoever sows generously will also reap generously. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. I don't know what your reward will be. And I don't want to take this away from you. There's so many stories that are true, accurate, and real about tenfold and hundredfold response to God. God can do that. God has done it, could do it. It just isn't promised. I know what my rewards have been. The blessing, the reward for me is for the intoxication of finances to be challenged in my own life. That's a, that's a reward. It's a blessing. Learning how to be content with less. That's a reward. To have the need to depend on the great provider. That's a reward. I don't know what your reward will be, but I know that God promises one. And he says, test me in this. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you, Lord, that you would challenge us in really uncomfortable ways. God, not to be a nuisance, but to be a blessing. God, you know the very motives of our hearts. God, you know the very things that would keep us disconnected from you, that would keep us disconnected from others, that would keep us stressed, that would keep us in conflict, that would keep us captive. And God, I just know that there's so many people in this room, including myself, that can benefit from being obedient to your invitation, to adhering to your wisdom. And so God, I just pray that you would speak, that nobody in the room would be obligated. God, you're not a God of obligation. But God, that you would convict by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would speak to people in ways that only you can. God, would you liberate us from our sinfulness? Would you liberate us from our debt. God, would you move powerfully this Christmas season? In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. A, a few practical next steps. Every semester we run Financial Peace University, and it's perhaps one of the most liberating uh, platforms for you to learn how to navigate your finances in a godly way. And so I'd highly encourage you in the new year to, to take a look at when we're hosting that and, and become a part of that. If you need practical ways to get out of debt, to manage your finances in a godly way, I would highly recommend you do that. And the last invitation is to just challenge you to think about the way that you would respond in giving. And I, I would argue to say that, that everyone should give. I don't care where you give. It could be here. It could be to the Red Cross. It could be to somewhere else. It could be to another church. But I want to challenge you to give this month. And I want to challenge you with what we call our next step giving. So if you've never given anything anywhere ever, just give something. It's super simple. Just give something to a cause that you believe in that's serving a need in the world. I would argue the church serves the greatest need. Find a church that you trust and give a gift. Find an organization that you trust and give a gift. If you've given a gift before, I would challenge you to just give regularly. Give a percentage regularly. Pick it, 1%, 2%. And just, just sign up for recurring giving somewhere and just test God in this. If you're doing that already, increase your percentage up to 10%. If you're already giving 10%, give generously beyond that. What is God calling you to in the next step? 
And I love that God is so courageous and bold enough to just go test me in this. Like you can cancel that recurring gift. You could, there, you could even get a refund, honestly, at, at most places. But I just want to, just with a clear call to action, to just challenge you towards this, this Christmas season. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Is it true? Test God in this. Let's worship together. You are listening to the Maker's Church Podcast. For more information about our community, please visit makerschurch.org.